Hello, I am Deborah McLaren, the MD of Love Reading. Welcome to this very special event with author Lauren Munoz. I am joined by Lauren and one of our star reading ambassadors, 16-year-old Betty. And we are here to talk about this brilliant debut YA novel called Suddenly a Murder. Lauren is a Mexican-American writer, a lawyer, and former teacher. Wow. I mean, seriously. Uh, and she's joining us today from her home in Southern Carolina. She received her JD from Northwestern University in Chicago. And when she's not writing or reading, she can be found knitting, crocheting, and collecting recipes for things she'll apparently never make. It sounds a bit like me. <laughs> Southern Carolina <laughs> is her debut novel. It's published on the 5th of September here in the UK in paperback by Hot Key Books, and it's awesome. And we can't wait. Betty and I are very excited to talk to Lauren today. Lauren, welcome. Thanks for joining. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're really, as I say, we're really, um, really pleased to, to be chatting. And Betty, great to see you. Yep, good to be here. <laughs> so let's get into this book. Let's talk about it. It is set in a, a glamorous art deco manner and our reviewer Joanne Owen called it a twisty contemporary murder mystery which sizzles with intrigue as the dark secrets of this privileged group of high schoolers all come to light. I read it on holiday a couple of weeks ago and I read it in one sitting. It's a read in one sitting beast. It's an absolute page turner. Um, huge congrats on the book. We, I, as I say, we all really loved it. I'm going to hand over to Betty now, as I know she has lots of great questions. Over to um, you. So I absolutely adored this book and I read quite a few murder mysteries. So for me, um, one of the things that I loved was how surprised I was every single step of the way. There was like a, there was a plot twist and it wasn't, it was really well done. So just congratulations. Oh, thank um, you. And it has been compared to the film Knives Out because of how twisty and turny and how many plot twists there are. Um, so I suppose my first question is, how would you describe your own book to people you meet? Yeah, so I think that, you know, one of the things I like about the Knives Out comparison is that, and I think the reason that people maybe compare it um, is that they're both sort of from the same source material. Um, they're both sort of from inspired by the golden age of detective fiction, uh, especially British, you know, crime fiction, you know, books that were written in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, Agatha Christie is the most, you know, famous one, but there were actually tons of them. And, you know, this this group of authors really created the country house murder plot. Um, and that is sort of the, you know, plot that Knives Out has is the plot that, you know, I took here. And it's just, it's my absolute favorite. Um, I love it. You've got this, you know, un, not very well liked person. Um, you've got everybody, want, you know, has a reason to want to do them in. Um, and you've got, you know, a close setting, a group of suspects, it's all in a small place. And you just get this like, you know, glamorous, glamorous setting, glamorous house. Um, so I've always adored, you know, reading that particular uh, plot device. Um, and so, you know, that's what I wanted for my book as well. Amazing. <laughs> um, so this is kind of, it's a very broad one, but how did you come up with the plot? I mean, I know that's kind of like a, how did you, I, it's one of those yeah. things, isn't it? Where you could come up with a plot lots of different ways. You could like uh, be inspired or you could just have an inkling of it. Um, and did you know from the beginning who was going to kill Blaine? Yeah, so, you know, it it's, I was actually doing a big reread of Agatha Christie, or it was actually a re-listen. Um, you know, there's an actor, his name's Hugh Fraser. Um, I think he plays Captain Hastings in some of the, you know, one of the um, uh, Agatha Christie's uh, TV series. Um, but he does these, you know, the Audible books, he reads them, and I was just re-listening to all of them, and I was like, you know, I just... I've always loved these. I love these so much. Um, I was like, it would just be so amazing. I just wish that I could wrap this into something contemporary, um, you know, something that was not a throwback, not historical, um, you know, but with sort of, you know, contemporary uh, teens. And, you know, I, I ran through a couple of sort of ideas about how I would do that, murder mystery party, that sort of thing. And I landed on this one because I, I actually just, I loved like 
I love dressing up um, when I was younger. Um, I still do. <laughs> um, but, you know, like I was very much like Halloween girl costume party. I think it's what is it called? Fancy dress party. <laughs> so I, I, I loved um, that. And I love, you know, sort of that you know, glam, um, you know, the glam, I just love clothes <laughs> as well, um, in sort of a aesthetic way. Um, and so I sort of landed on the idea of, well, why not have people like, you know, kids like that, um, who just have this really big passion for a period of time. Um, you know, you've got Cassidy who, uh, when, you know, wants to be a costume designer of this, and they love these old movies from the 1920s. Um, and so it really sort of spawned from, from there, um, of, uh, you know, how to get them. And the other thing is, you know, one of the problems you have writing contemporary YA is that you have to make a choice about technology. So you have to choose, am I going to find a way to get rid of it? You know, am I going to strand them on an island? It's a huge <laughs> thing. Right? You strand them on an island with a storm, so many storms in YA, <laughs> you know, it's massive hurricanes everywhere. Um, so, you know, or you kind of go into it and you have like, you know, a lot of like often texting um, or, you know, people, you know, sort of that, you know, aspect of it, like, how do you wrap that in? Um, so I, I definitely knew that I wanted to get them sort of in this closed circle without technology, because I wanted to have that old throwback 1920s feel to it, like all the way around. Um, mm. and so, you know, that's kind of how I chose the plot there. Um, I did always know uh, who uh, killed Blaine. I did. So I, I'm not a huge, um, so I guess they call them, I guess people call it like a plotter versus pantser or whatever the people who, you know, you plot out the whole thing. Um, I, I know friends who will plot out just every element of their story and just write it from there, which is amazing. Um, and then there's people who just sort of like, you know, start from the beginning. I think it was, you know, Ray Bradbury, who's really famous for just sitting down at a typewriter and just being like, oh, here, I write from, you know, feeling, which is also amazing. Like, so I can't really, I, I'm not really either of those, but um, I do, I did want to start with knowing you know, how it ended. Um, and that way, you know, I could sort of build that in as I wrote. Um, some of the motives, you know, developed over time, but even that I had sort of an idea of, you know, why everybody, you know, might want, might want him dead. So I did know. I love it. Um, Lauren, what would be great is this is probably quite a nice um, time for you to, you to do a bit of a reading for us, if you don't mind. Sure. I think you'll, are you going to do the prologue? I am, yeah, the prologue. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. The knife burns cold in my trembling hand. I lock Blaine's door with a soft click so no one can follow me into his bedroom. The others are getting dressed for cocktail hour, but it would be unforgivable to take any risks now that I've come this far. The antique shower plumbing whistles and bangs as loudly as the rusty boiler in Marin Academy's basement. Even so, I hold my breath as I creep toward the bathroom. I hide behind the cracked door and peer through the gap. Blaine is standing in the canary yellow tub, a sheer shower curtain drawn around him, his head and chest barely visible through the swirling steam. The vintage bowl bathing suit he'd worn to the beach is in a heap on the mosaic tile. Each bathroom in Ashwood Manor has been meticulously preserved, and Blaine's is decorated with golden art deco mirrors. I look at the gold blade of my knife. They match. If I were the kind of person who believed in signs, I might think the universe approved of the crime I was about to commit, but I'm not that kind of person. That person would have spilled their secret to Cassidy weeks ago, hoping the universe would repay their good deed. I'm more of a don't muck with my future if you don't want to meet my knife kind of girl. At least I want to be. My shaking hands tell a different story. Blaine's eyes are closed his head tipped up to the water as it cascades down with the delicate patter typical of old houses, a quiet contrast to the thumping plumbing in the walls. It's a soothing sound, like spring rain, and I briefly flash back to the day before prom, when Blaine danced in my apartment building's courtyard during a storm while my family and I laughed from the sidewalk. He looked vulnerable and young then, just as he does now, standing naked and defenseless in the shower. I've been waiting for this moment obsessing over the details in my head for days. But as Blaine runs his hands through his ginger hair, slowly pushing a stream of water off his forehead and down his freckled back, a burning guilt spreads through my arms, almost making me drop the knife. Blaine doesn't deserve this, not really, but neither do I. And I can't sit back and let him destroy my life. I grip the knife tighter and step through the doorway. 
Amazing. Goosebumps. <laughs> Fantastic. Back to you, Betty. <laughs> um, so my third question is, why have you written from the perspective of the would-be killer? It's a great question. Um, you know, I... It was one of the first sort of things that I, I definitely, you know, wanted was for everyone to be a suspect. Um, and I liked the idea of having a potentially unreliable narrator mm -hmm. um, to give it that sort of, it, it made it fun for me to write too, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, you have to, it's, it's tricky um, to, to make sure that you don't reveal one way or the other mm -hmm. um, as you write it. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I, it was hard to decide in some ways because, there, you know, a lot of YA, basically you've got sort of the teen detective, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of element. But here I think that I wanted to give it sort of that little extra sort of thriller element of, mm -hmm. you know, what is actually going on? Um, is this person, you know, telling us the truth? Is they, are they telling us, you know, the real story. Um, and so then you've also got, you know, that complication along with the complication of all of the other suspects. Um, mm -hmm. So it just makes it a sort of all around who done it um, with everybody, you know, in play, including this, you know, potentially unreliable narrator. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> um, so this kind of, it feeds into the same question, but all throughout the book, you switch character perspectives as well as from first to third person. Um, so not only did that make it incredibly fast paced and incredibly page turning, um, but it also kept you guessing about what the plot was going to reveal and it made it really fun. Um, how did you decide what was going to come next and why did you choose to structure the plot the way you did? Well, I can thank my editor for that, actually. Um, so the original version of this um, did not have uh, the flashbacks. Ah, um, didn't have the third person. It was a straightforward sort of, it was a straightforward sort of old school in the sense of, you know, if you, when you read like an Agatha Christie, Dorothy, you know, Dorothy Sayers, whatever, all of these, you get sort of this almost flat narrative where you've got a detective and the characters, one of the things that, one of the reasons that those old books work is that you don't know too much about the characters in a way, right? So one of the reasons you can get very surprised um, by an mm -hmm. Agatha Christie, it's difficult to figure out her plots is that she does give you a lot of the clues, you know, she does fair play-ish, um, but, <laughs> but she keeps her characters sort of at a distance from you. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, my editor was like, well, he was like, I just, you know, with YA, we want more background, you know, for the characters. Can you do that? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. Are you kidding? I get to like <laughs> write about all of my characters, all these people in my head that I've had to sort of like keep in the background of my head. Um, now I get to, you know, write, write, you know, from these characters. So um, in terms of choosing first person versus third person, that was a tough choice. Um, I did want to keep sort of the, I wanted to keep the present narrative very distinct from the past narrative mm -hmm. um so went ahead and you know went and did third person um i also like kind of the distance it gave me i love writing third person actually um so it gave a little bit more distance with the characters too mm -hmm. so that the readers like observing them um and so it makes you it it makes it so that we're observing them like critically like hmm is mm -hmm. it is it them? You know, because if yeah. you get too much in people's heads, then you've got a bunch of potentially unreliable narrators and that actually m meshes it a little bit too, you know, much. So I really like, I really wanted to keep, you know, the, the characters with us viewing them in that, you know, third person and only having Izzy as that kind of immediate, um, you know, first person. But I, I loved writing the, I loved writing the, you know, flashbacks. It was very fun to kind of get their world, you know, yeah. on paper, whereas the original draft had really just been at the house. It's it must have been so difficult to keep track of as a writer, though, but, you know, because it, it's so choppy and changey and twisty and turny. I, you know, well done. No, it's great. And good call on the editor. I think it, it, it makes it really yeah. I, I, oh, uh, yeah. I love my editor. Polo is absolutely wonderful. Um, he has such a, you know, he's just got to, he's, he's wonderful to work with. So it was a really great experience um, and very interesting for me who'd never, you know, been part of sort of a big, you know, edit before. So yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it was interesting because there was so, 
it, one of the nice things about the flashbacks too, is that you didn't, there wasn't really anything in the main that was changed. So a lot the main story sort of stayed the same and just sort of slotted in, you know, um, the backstory to give more, more information on the characters. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so as the book is centered on Izzy, an aspiring journalist who only attends her prestigious school um, because of her mum, why did you include class difference as a major theme? Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the interesting things about so I love Poirot, you know, Agatha Christie's detective. Yeah. Um, and one of the interesting things about him that, you know, I didn't know for a long time, it wasn't really until some of the I didn't really think about it. You know, it wasn't really my focus, you know, of reading it when I was quite young. Um, and then as I got older, um, you know, I sort of started noticing it. But she she casts him as the sort of a, a Belgian refugee. Um, you know, he's seeking refuge in England from World mm -hmm. War One. Um, and one of the great things about choosing to do that is that you know he becomes very much like an outsider um, mm -hmm. in this sort of English society. Often, you know, they uh, they mistake him for a Frenchman all the time. Um, you know, they just underestimate him. Mm -hmm. um you know all the time and that plays out you know very well uh in terms of his character because you're you know you've got all of the suspects they don't suspect him basically of being extremely competent and very you know clever <laughs> at his job um so they're willing to tell him whatever and let him into their house and you know let him into their worlds um and not only that it allows you to kind of root for him as you know sort of an underdog um even though he's you know extremely clever so i thought that it fit in really well with i wanted izzy to be um, underestimated. You know, I think that that was one of the other reasons that, you know, from her first person, potentially unreliable narrator, I liked the idea of her being underestimated by, you know, her peers, mm -hmm. um, and sort of thought of uh, as lesser than, you know, not with sort of maybe, you know, of course her, you know, best friend, um, but the sort of outside social group, you know, that's sort of on the fringes of her, you know, friendships, um, think of her just a little bit less, you know, even if they wouldn't recognize it, even if they wouldn't say it or think it to themselves, um, you know, there's always that element of you're not, you know, one of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I needed her to have, I wanted her to have that edge. Um, and I think that that, you know, helps drive her. That's part of her personal ambition uh, for mm -hmm. why she wants to do so well in school. It's why she wants to go to such a good college. Um, you know, it really, I think, uh, you know, anticipates why she kind of behaves like she does as well. Mm -hmm. um, this sort of chip on her shoulder, outsider feeling. Um, so that was, you know, it was a it was a way to do that. Um, and it also just, you know, it there's sort of a race class dynamic there um, as well, um, sort of element to it um, mm -hmm. that I wanted in there, uh, sort of, you know, that level of outsider. Um, and to kind of have her, you know, mom and her and, you know, her family, be very, you know, have this sort of separation um, and yeah. have these you know, reasons for why they do things, um, mm. and things like that, so. Um, to mark the end of high school, Izzy's friend Cassidy arranges for their friendship group to spend a week in the Island Manor um, in an opulent Art Deco 1920s getaway. So why did you choose to include specifically the 1920s themed kind of aesthetic? Yeah, um, I love it. I mean, it's, you know, I personally um, love that aesthetic. Um, so that was part of it. And also just, you know, there's so many sort of elements and tropes in here that relate back to that golden age, right? So mm -hmm. you've got, you know, little things, big things, um, you know, basically the whole thing. I wanted there to be as much throwback, um, you know, as possible, but I didn't really want it to necessarily, I didn't want this particular one to be you know, about books so much. And so that's why I sort of went with the, you know, 1920s film, um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the film had, that their favorite film, their favorite 1920s film had been filmed there, you know, on the set. Um, that was the set of it. I sort of liked that um, better, but it also, it gives it that, you know, it just gives it that framework that, you know, it gives it that framework of the country house murder. So it's just one more element um, of like, sort of that throwback that I really wanted to have for this book. And I wanted it to be kind of a, you know, like a spot, spot the trope um, sort of thing for people who, you know, I think that one of the challenges, one of the things that is interesting to me um, 
about writing it was just that it had to work on two levels. First, it had to work for people who have never read a single book from the golden age ever. <laughs> um, so, you know, like it had to work for people who have never heard of the golden age, who have heard of Agatha Christie because she's on TV and have never read her book. But then I also wanted it to be kind of a fun moment mm -hmm. for people who have read you know, those books, it can be like, oh, this, you know, I've, I recognize this, I recognize this either from an adaptation, um, yeah. or I recognize this from what I read, I recognize this description of clothing, this description of food, this thing, these you know, paintings on the wall, like any, every, and also just like, you know, tennis courts, you know, that go down, you know, there's so many in these old books, you've got, you know, so many people are just like playing afternoon tennis and having cocktails on the terrace. And it's just <laughs> on and on and on, you know, the same sort of things over and over again. So I wanted there to be those moments for people who have read that um, as kind of a throwback. And also it was just so much fun for me because I love that, you know, aesthetic and I love those houses and all that, you know, clothes and stuff. So. You could just visualize, for me, in my head, I could just visualize every intricate detail as I read it. It really brought it to life because you chose that 1920s theme. I thought it was great. It was so it was much fun to read. It's yeah, excellent. Totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so this is, again, quite a broad question, but how did you decide on the personality of your characters? Yeah, you know, it's... You know, it's kind of it's kind of weird actually. It's in this and it's, it's just it's weird because it sounds silly. It sounds silly to me, um, but it is kind of also true. They kind of just can't. They just sort of seem like they were. It's a, it's a non it's a non answer almost. And I, I I know that. I just they kind of came as they were. Um, you know, to me, and they just sort of built in my head as they talked. In terms of that, and those are sort of for the side characters. For the main mm -hmm. characters. What I really wanted was, you know, a strong core friendship mm -hmm. um, and sort of then this sort of interesting love interest. Mm -hmm. um, and so for Izzy, I needed, you know, I needed her to be this sort of driven and ambitious, you know, teen girl. Um, and then I thought I wanted, and the, but even, even Cassidy just sort of you know, came from being the kind of, I wanted them to have sort of be different. You know, I wanted them to be a little bit different, but even when I just thought of Cassidy and just start, I mean, the first, you know, when you, first, at least when I first start writing, you know, there are a lot of scenes, a million scenes that don't make it in. And a lot of those scenes were you just banter, just friendship banter, um, you know, between Izzy and Cassidy or, you know, banter between Izzy and Marlo. Um, and so those but, you know, those personalities just kind of develop as you write the characters. So for me, it just sort of filled in as I wrote it. So I wish I had a better answer than it came to me in my head. Um, but it is kind of true. I, you know, I think that, I think that now as I'm, you know, writing and I'm working on, you know, my second one, uh, I have, I have a better sense this time around of what I need the characters to be to make the plot a certain way, <laughs> um, actually. So, you know, after having revised this and having, you know, written it, it's very helpful. You know, the revision process is so helpful for your next book, actually, because you can do a lot of that work up front. Um, so now that, you know, I'm moving on to another project, I think that my characters are not so much coming to me as I am deciding what I need them to be. Um, mm -hmm. But this one, you know, maybe because you just, also when you write these first books, you don't expect anybody to read them. Like you don't, you just, you write them and you expect they'll get rejected and then you move on to something, you know? So like you're writing it and it's, it's fun that way because you're writing it for yourself in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. Um, so for me, these are just, you know, the characters that, you know, I wanted to write with and it came to my head, so. Love it. Amazing. Um, so do you think you'll write another novel with the same characters or do you think you'll revisit those characters again? I'd love to. I'd love to. I love. I. I would love to. Partly because I actually. I love Pilar so much. Um, the detective. She is so much fun mm. to write. Um, yeah. and I just. You know. I have. You know. You have these ideas. I already have these ideas of. You know. Izzy in Mexico. Marlo coming to visit. Another crime happening on the campus. Pilar de Leon. Um. So you know. I've got it. Um. But you know. On um, as in as in all things, it depends on whether anybody wants a second book. Um, you know, so we you, hope, we yeah. <laughs> you, hope, you hope that enough people do where uh, your team also wants it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I would certainly love that um, because, you know, I've already got an idea of how that would go. Um, but yeah, we'll see, I guess, I hope. Brilliant. Perfect. Um, so obviously this is your debut novel, which is amazing. 
Um, what was your path to publication like? Um, yeah, a bit twisty. Um, so actually I, I, gosh, how long ago did I start writing? I mean, I've been writing, I've been writing since I've been young. I was wondering if I had my, I don't think I have it. I, I started, you know, when I was in elementary school, I was already sort of writing stories. I was definitely the girl who like told her friends stories on the bus off of papers. Um, so, you know, like, I did that. And then for a long time, I just didn't really have it in mind. You know, for a long time, I didn't really write anything. Um, and then I think I got, when I was in law school, I started thinking about it again. Um, and so then after law school was over and I started working, I started working on this first sort of manuscript um, and sent it around. And I wrote a couple and sent them around, you know, they got full, they got some full requests, some interest, but I wasn't really there yet, you know? Um, and for a couple of reasons, partly I just didn't know what the market was. So mm -hmm. I wasn't really, you know, back that was, gosh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. So back then there wasn't sort of this like online bookstagram, you know, literary Twitter, you know, sort of giving you an indication of, you know, what, you know, how you needed to approach it. So I hadn't mm -hmm. thought in terms of, you know, I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought about the market very much. So I wrote a couple manuscripts and then I had to, I was kind of, I, I moved cities um, and got another job, um, another legal job, and it was very intense. Uh, and so I didn't have really any time. So for years, I didn't write anything. Um, and then I left that job and went to a different one that was less intense. And then I thought, I was like, you know, I just, I really love this. I've really missed it. Um, so I started writing again. And it was another couple of manuscripts, um, different ones. I didn't, th this is the first YA mystery. I've actually written. Um, the other ones were like sci-fi and fantasy. Right. <laughs> I was just sort of randomly writing whatever I wanted. Some of them were low grade. Um, so yeah, and then I, you know, had got this idea, and it was summer of 2020, um, and uh, I wrote it, it. It took about six months, and then I started querying it, um, and started getting, you know, interest, and I got some offers. Um, and then I got an offer um, from Jody Reamer, who's my agent now, um, a few months you know, later, and I accepted. And then uh, we did a little bit of revising, not much. Um, there was just a little bit, and she sent it out, and it was only on sub for like a week or two. It was, it was pretty fast turnaround. Um, and uh, then I you know, went, chose my editor, and, and that was that, and that was maybe... Yeah, it was it was a couple of years ago. That's the that's the wild part is that, you know, you I wrote this in 2020 and now it's you know finally just mm -hmm. you know coming out. So it's a it's a long, very, very long process. Um so I would say that, you know, it was stops and starts um while I sort of wrote for myself and wrote for fun and then wrote for attempted publication and then finally got one through. Yay. <laughs> Can we just talk? I mean, this is categorized as 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 YA, isn't it? It's a young adult book. And I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about this because I now read loads of children's books. I read loads of YA, but I don't think historically I really knew what YA was, you know, and I think I may have discounted books because they were YA. But I think it's so important to say this book is for ev is for everyone. You know, I know on our Love Reading for Kids site, we categorise it as, as 13 plus YA. On Love Reading, it is there under the YA category, but it is such a page turner. It's particularly good for people who don't see themselves as readers, people who don't want to read lengthy tones, grapple with classics. It's so accessible. It's so readable. And it's fiction that you won't want to put down. So what made you decide on, on YA? Yeah. So I, you know, I part, I, it was because when I started wanting to write, I was reading tons of YA. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was reading, it was the, it was the time of t Twilight and Divergent, you know, yeah. sort of YA dystopia fantasies. Um, and I just, you know, just devoured them. Um, this was probably my early twenties. Um, and so I, you know, very, it's very much of a, you want to write what you're reading um, at yeah. the time. And I never yeah. sort of let it go for, you know, for several reasons. First of all, so I was a teacher um, before I went to law school. I taught high school and I taught uh, bilingual elementary school. Um, so, you know, partly I wanted to write for that age group, for mm -hmm. the age group I had taught. Um, and 
I, you know, it's interesting you say about that, you know, fast pace, you know, readers that, you know, non-traditional readers and stuff, because that was the kind of book that, you know, I mean, I really loved that kind of book growing up. I yeah. loved the page turners, you know, growing yeah. up sort of those point horror or thrillers, you know, Carolyn B. Cooney thrillers. They, there's, you know, that style was something that I just, you know, devoured or the Nancy Drew books, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, in terms of stylistically um, what I like and what I like to write, um, young adult is really where it's at. Although I, ag I agree with you. And I think one of the reasons, you know, one of the, it's, you know, the marketing term is crossover appeal. Um, yeah. But I think that, you know, I think there are two things. First, you know, the, when they do studies, the average age of YA readers is 35. Um, so YA is more like a, it's, it's, it's very much more like a genre than it is a target age group for reading. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, and I think that what it, you know, it's, and it's an interesting one to write in because you really are, you know, you're trying to make it accessible for teen readers. Um, yeah. you know, that's your target, but at the same time, you understand that, a lot of your readers are going to be adults. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. you know, you're writing something that, you know, you think that lots of people is going to have a broad appeal, yeah. um, broad appeal. And, you know, this is just the kind of book that, you know, I I would really like reading I mean, myself and would have liked reading as a teen. Um, absolutely. So. And I'm a lot older than that. And I absolutely loved it. So I do. I just, yeah. as a, you know, there's, I think there's work to be done in 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 getting these books into the hands of of everyone because I just think they have such yeah I I completely agree and I, I I do think that sometimes people do think oh well I don't I'm not I don't need you know I want to read that that's why or something like that um yeah. and I do think they're you know kind of missing out on a lot of fun um fun so books. much fun so much fun Lauren thank you so much for joining us today um Thank you for talking to us. We, you might have guessed, we we love the book. <laughs> um, Betty, thank you for your questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure. The time has gone so quickly. Um, everyone, go and buy Suddenly a Murder. You can get it on Love Reading or Love Reading for Kids. You will get 10% off the RRP and you can donate 25% to a school close to your heart or pick it up in your library or pick it up in your school library. It's published on the 5th of September in the UK by Hot Key Books. It's highly recommended by me, by Betty and all of us at Love Reading and Love Reading for Kids who've read it. Lauren, thank you. Thank you for writing this book and thank you for joining us.